It's nice to see you all. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I can see some familiar faces and I can see some faces that I haven't seen before, but it's nice to see you all. Um, and again, a big thank you to all of us for joining today's session. We appreciate it. Um, it's our first webinar for the year. And so it was, uh, we're all looking forward to it. And I hope and I pray that it's going to be an impactful session for us. Um, I'm going to take us through uh, some slides around, that share some thoughts around uh, the theme for, uh, for this year. As Jix has aptly said, we normally sit with um, a theme at the start of the year that sort of just guides us in terms of what is important in the year and enables us to keep um, going back to the same values and sort of the same thought process. And so I'm going to share some thoughts around today's um, theme, which is called the Frogging Revolution. Let me also first recognize um, Mary Lynn. Um, she's one of the lapid people who are going through the current court of lapid who prepared these slides. Um, I don't know if she is somewhere, she must be somewhere in the background and I just wanted to thank her for taking the time to work on them. Thank you, Melanie. Melanie for doing the work of putting together these slides. Um, I am grateful. And also it's nice to see all of us here um, just having this conversation. You will allow me to start with a word of prayer. This is the first webinar that we are hosting this year. So I kind of have to do some important things. And one of them is just submit this webinar and the other future webinars to God. So allow me to start with a word of prayer. Father, we honor you and we bless you. We thank you because it's not by power, nor by might, but by your spirit, the Lord, we're able to run this webinars, Lord. Thank you because you, you alone is able to breathe life into humans' words, Lord. Your word tells us in the book of Ezekiel of dry bones that moved around, Lord, that were dry bones, Lord. But Father, you command your prophet to speak breath of life into those dry bones. And out of those dry bones, Lord, you raise an army. And Father, I submit myself to you. I submit this webinars to you, Lord. And I recognize that unless your power and your presence comes and goes with us, they will be dry bones. And so, Jesus, we invoke your presence in this call, Lord. We invoke, we invoke your presence in this webinars, Father. We ask that, Father, you take the words and the conversations of this webinars, Lord, and that you use them for your glory, Father. I pray that Jehovah God, even for every other webinar that we will be having over the course of the year, Lord, that Jehovah God, you breathe life into them, Jehovah Father. And that, Father, because you breathe life into them, the Lord, you will use them to raise an army of men and women who trust you for greater things than man can do, Lord. So Holy Spirit of God, come and order this conversation. Come and breathe life into this conversation. Position. Come and breathe life into all of us. Come and use the position for your glory, Lord. That Jehovah God, if there are men and women here who are tired, that Father, you use this conversation to breathe life into them. If there are men and women who are hopeless, who are frustrated, use this conversation to breathe life in them. And even for those of us who are excited about this year, Lord, may this be a word of affirmation that Jehovah God, you have spoken to them. And so, Lord, we invite you here. We ask that, Father, we would enter an ark that your spirit is able to speak in and speak through. We love you. We honor you greatly. And we lift your name in this place. And we give you a central place in all that we will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, as I've mentioned... This is our year of leapfrogging revolution. I am very excited about that theme. Um, just for context purposes, I will just share how this came about. I was in India in August and I left for my employment in August. And so August tends to be an, a month of reflection for me. Um, and last year, August was, was the ninth year. This year is the 10th year. And so as we were doing, we were doing a conference in, um, in India alongside the other Obama fellows. One of the things that I asked God is for a word for the next season. And, and in many ways, he sent a word around divine upgrades. Um, I remember uh, one of the things that I enjoyed was actually an upgrade in um, my flight and just sitting in uh, the business class and spending some time just reflecting on the things that God had done for the last, the previous nine years and just trusting him for bigger things in the year that was to come. And so that started the word of divine upgrades. And in fact, for me personally, that's a word that I'm working with for the year. But I felt that we had done very heavy themes in the previous year and I wanted a bit of um, 
business like kind of theme and so i asked god for a name that would mean divine upgrades but which would have a business connotation to it and that's how lead frogging revolution came about um and we're really looking forward to it um and seeing what it's going to represent and what are the things that the year will bring to us in terms of um lessons though so this is a very new land that I am using. Yes. Um, I wanted to start with sort of just some thoughts around what the theme means for me personally. I will also then share, and I'm hoping that Jix is sort of able to help me with uh, admitting guys, because I think it's coming through on my end. Um, but the, I will share some thoughts around what this theme for means for me personally. I'll also take us through some thoughts around what is a leapfrogging? What is leapfrogging? What does it mean? Um, I'll share some examples um, that are just exciting thoughts around what leapfrogging means. And then we will use those to be able to pick up some thoughts around how do we win in a year of leapfrogging and a, sort of how do we build a leapfrogging mindset that's able to ensure that we succeed in our lives and in the missions that uh, God has given us to, uh, to take. So for me personally, just as I mentioned, it was a very personal journey towards getting to this theme and it represents what we call divine upgrades um this year it will be my 10th year since i left for my employment and so just that whole process of and i shared a post recently when i look at the last uh, nine headed to 10 years this has been the biggest classroom that i have been in and i've been in many classrooms and classrooms are not necessarily classrooms but it's places that you go to learn um and as i've gone i've gone through phenomenal and many classes in my lifetime and i and so far and i, bl I bless god for this and i trust god for even bigger things so far, the lapid has been the biggest lesson that I've gone through and just sort of reflecting over the last 10 years and the things that God has been teaching me and enabling me to be able to do is what this leapfrogging revolution is all about. So I've actually created what's called a Patreon account and I'm sharing quite a bit of, a, of content there around the journey, around the, uh, the lessons in it. My faith plays a very big part in the work that I do and so it sort of talks about the intersection between faith, purpose and justice and I'll share the link towards the end. But the point I'm trying to make here is this is for me a very personal um, theme and this is me inviting us to my diary with the Lord more than anything. Um, when I was thinking about this leapfrogging, the way I have been, uh, when I look at my journey, I am a person who thrives in intersectionalities. Um, I have my career has been heavy in male denominate male dominated fields. Um, I remember starting my professional life and sort of just seeing the number of women who were in the senior positions in the organizations that I was in. And so I've always been the woman in very male you know, dominated kind of as places. And I sense that I'm able then to bring that conversation around what is the power of women? Um, and I know there's a lot of debates as to whether we need to have gender equality and women should have a space within the economy. Until we have millicides, we're still talking about femicides. And that just tells you that we still need to do quite a bit of work in terms of elevating uh, the female gender. I am also a huge believer that in this shift, especially uh, we're in a shift that needs to happen as far as the climate change goes. And this shift has to be led by women. There's um, a sight, an innovation, and an intuitiveness that women have that we need to make sure that we keep elevating. And so you will find that Lapid unapologetically as a majority of women, and that's not to say we do not have men, we love doing work with our brothers but it's to say we are unapologetic about the fact that we need to elevate women um, as we go through the various uh, transitions in our time so I think of myself as a person who has an assignment in terms of gender equality in terms of ensuring that women have a table in the seat I come from very strong women I never thought about the difference between the gender dynamics but I see that I, I see that in the conversation that we are having today as far as femicide goes I see that when we look at generally when you look at political photos you will hardly see women sitting in those tables and that tells you that there's a gap you cannot be okay with half of the population missing in conversations and perhaps a lot of the messes that we speak to today are because that half is missing on the table and so that's an area that I'm passionate about another area I'm very passionate about is the intersection between corporate and development. Um, as was said in my bio, I had the privilege of starting my professional life in PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is considered one of the big four audit firms and managed to do quite a bit of assignments in the corporate space. Um, 
from oil and gas to uh, financial services, which is probably the place that I thrived the most and still thrive in, and to public sector. And so I have a good understanding of what happens in the corporate space, which is perhaps the advantage of starting a career in audit and in consulting spaces, because you see a very broad uh, perception around the industry. But my bigger, my bigger passion is the intersection between corporate and development. I see a lot of possibilities that can happen if corporate picks up development work. And I see a lot of work that can happen if development work picks up the healthy aspects of corporate. And so that intersectionality is something that I'm very passionate about and will continue to do quite a bit of work around. And the last intersectionality that I'm passionate about is uh, global and local intersectionalities. Um, I tell people when LAPID started, I thought our assignment was purely African. Um, over the years, I have come to the recognition. It's my understanding of Africa rising is African people rising and sort of just being at the forefront of the healing work that needs to happen globally. Um, when you hear a lot of the chaos that we talk about today from the geopolitical issues that are plaguing our world today through the climate change issues, um, to the economic issues that are prevalent today, at the heart of that is issues around social equity, um, our perceptions of what matters in life. And I believe firmly that if Africans take up their space, Africa Rising is not about us being rescued. Um, it's about Africans realizing who we are and sort of just taking our space in the global uh, conversation, and that will help with the healing of the world. And so that intersectionality of local and global is something I'm very passionate about and building bridges that allow things to happen between Africa um, and globally. I've had the privilege of, as was shared, spending about a year in the context of the U.S. and doing a fellowship that was uh, funded by the Oprah Winfrey Foundation. I've had the privilege of working and living in the U.K while I was still in the US. I've had the privilege of um, interacting with quite a number of countries within the continent. And I see the power of us thinking together. I um, mean, one of the communities that I'm in at the moment that I really respect greatly, we ask, what does it look like for us to build communities that a global in view. So bring together Black people from across the world to have conversations around climate justice. I do see the value of local in global and global in local. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. And those are the areas that I personally see as areas for leapfrogging. And so as I talk about the leapfrogging revolution, you'll find me going back to those examples as places that we need to sit with. So maybe to start at the top um, and ask what is leapfrogging? Um, leapfrogging is a concept and as I mentioned these slides I should have actually run through them but they uh, they were done by Melanie and I'm grateful for them but leapfrogging is a concept that was used in many domains that's used in many domains of economics and business um, and I want to share that in the context of examples what has leapfrogging meant what has leapfrogging done in the economic space in the business space um, in the military space there is a concept around leapfrogging and use that to be able to ask what are things that we we need to learn from leapfrogging. So it's a concept that's used in many domains. Um, many people think about it just in the context of economics, but actually you will find from the examples it's in many domains. Um, and by definition, it's the ability of a developing one of the definitions, actually not the only definition, uh, but one of the definitions, it's the ability of developing or less developed countries to, to essentially keep less efficient um, and higher carbon intensive technologies during the course of their development. The bigger picture of leapfrogging is the idea of skipping. So when I was thinking about leapfrogging from a personal perspective, I, my days, I hear now they have different names. We had things called nursery schools. It was pre-primary school and we would do three years of pre-primary school. And I did nursery one, I did nursery two. And then my teacher request uh, suggested that I skip nursery three and went direct to standard one. Um, and that's a leapfrogging of some sort from a personal perspective. So when you think about leapfrogging, think about skipping, skipping process skipping standards, skipping things that have been done in the past is the best. And that's why you're seeing this image on the on my left of somebody skipping, because that's one of the things that you think about when you think about um, leapfrogging. Um, and so when you place emphasis on that, um, you then start to sit with the idea of instead of following the same path, as when you think about this from an African perspective, instead of us following the same path that developed nations have followed, which often was costly, 
which often led to the climate issues we have today. Leapfrogging invites developing nations or what people call developing nations to jump directly to the latest technologies. And so the whole idea of stage skipping becomes very important in leapfrogging and the idea of path creating becomes very important in the leapfrogging definition. So if you forget everything I'm saying, just so that I simplify this, here are two things, leapfrogging has stage skipping and path creating, stage skipping and path creating. And this is important from Africa's perspective because one of our gaps as young, young leaders, as emerging leaders, as a continent, is we think of the West as they know it all. And because we think of the West as they know it all, we try and copy what they do. But if you ask them and they know it, a lot of their systems haven't served the majority of the people. They've served a small proportion of the people. And so if you're going to be copying what they're doing, then you're copying inequality. I remember, and I'll give this as an example, I remember when we were doing um, one of the roads in Kenya that I will not name, the question that people, people kept asking, is this the most efficient use of our money? Do we want to create roads that serve the minority? Or do we want to create infrastructure that serves the majority? Now, if you're trying to copy the West, you will create those roads that serve the minority because it makes you look like the West. And in that case, the West are the standards of success. However, if you go to the West, if you go to New York, for example, one of the things you hear all of them saying is that the way the city is built doesn't work for humans. They don't have enough parks. They just have one concrete thing after another concrete thing. And so leapfrogging invites us to skip that and ask, what does it look like for us to build cities that are healthier, that have seat, that have playgrounds and have places where people go and hang out. That is the idea behind leapfrogging. It's skipping stages. It's skipping what people have done in the past and asking what can you be able to do that's different. Um, and then therefore then that becomes leapfrogging. So I wanted to share some examples of stage skipping just so that we see that in the context of the life um, business um, and various other places. So for example, this will not relate for um, a lot of young people, but for intersectional generations like ours, transitional generations, there's like a time when we had a thing called landlines and you will see a photo of a landline there. And a lot of our calls for the wealthy people was through um, uh, landlines. And that meant you had to go to a specific place to do a call and then pray. I remember in my high school, we had this red, um, I don't know, phone, phone booths. And if you wanted to call home, if you wanted to call some guy, you all went and you had a very long queue. And if that phone does decides that day it's not working, you all are not making calls. And so that's the norm that was prevalent across the world, which is the landlines. And then the mobile phones came in and they, in Africa, we leapfrogged the landlines because the majority of places, people did not have landlines. But now, if you look at the acceptance and the penetration of mobile phones, it's much higher than landlines, which means we skipped landlines and adopted mobile phones. And that in some ways has advantages because landlines, you had to put up some huge uh, infrastructure that in many ways would be costing us in terms of the energy that will be used. And so that's leapfrogging at work. Um, when you think about banking, the financial inclusion in Kenya was very low. Um, we used to send money using a kamba. You put money in an envelope, you hide it in a socks and you send it with somebody. That was a truth for some of us. I remember when I was in high school again, how money used to land to us was just the most dramatic process. But what happened when we moved towards mobile banking and M-Pesa, which is now normalized, is we leapfrogged banking. So while before we had a small percentage of people who had bank accounts, now a majority of us have mobile banking. And so we leapfrogged from what was accepted as the normal way of banking and we went into mobile banking. And the advantage of that is financial inclusion in terms of energy consumption. It's much higher when you're using mobile banking than the normal banking that was done before. But even more is the inequality is reduced. Because in banking in those days when I was in campus, we used to have this thing of you had to go to poster bank, like most of us an accounts with poster. And in that account for poster, there's a minimum you had to keep. And then you had to withdraw money once in seven days. This was a reality. 
pesa yako si pesa ya mtu mwingine inakaa in an account for seven days so if i withdraw money today i cannot withdraw until seven days have passed that's the kind of banking that we had and that speaks to the challenges of access that we had to finances and mobile banking has then jumped that face we didn't bother with creating a prevalent banking and instead we've more normalized the mobile banking another example of stage skipping is electrification so in many spaces and this is prevalent in the West, you will see electrification and a lot of trees that have been put up and a lot of energy that's used to be able to put up electricity. And, and there's a whole conversation in, around the fossil fuels that have built the electrification of today's world. In Africa, a lot of countries are leapfrogging that electrification and going to renewable energy. Why? Many of our homes don't have electricity. There's some numbers I was looking at that I don't have here that were just shocking in terms of the level of um, electricity, like the access to electricity in this continent is still very low. And so what people have done, because we are innovative human beings, is we are leapfrogging that thing and we're using the renewable energy. So solar energy is prevalent. So for example, in Kenya, you will, when you look at the number, Kenya's has the, one of the highest renewable energy adoption in the world. And that tells you we've leapfrogged this whole idea of putting up these trees and using fossil fuels, and we are instead adopting renewable energy, leapfrogging at work. Another example, this is prevalent in China and India, and especially in continents where populations are high. People are saying, if you're going to address climate issues, you cannot address them the way the industrial age did transportation. Because can you imagine China, 1.4 billion people, India, 1.4 billion people, 1.3 billion people, everybody owning a car. That would be madness. And so for starters, there's an adoption towards electric and hybrid vehicles, which reduces the fossil fuels. But even more is we are asking questions around how do we create different transport systems? Um, when you think about access to health, it's a problem across the continent. Rwanda is a perfect example of leapfrogging. Um, they started to use drones to deliver blood and it was actually started by people. All of these things are innovations that have been started by people within the continent. The one for Rwanda is that some guys had gone for um, hiking and as they were hiking, they were told if one of you falls, it takes days for blood to be transported from Kigali to where they were. And the person said that doesn't make sense in an age where you have drones. And so drones have become so prevalent in Rwanda in terms of transporting blood between the capital city and the remote places. And that has increased access to health solutions. Mobile health solutions have become prevalent and I see them becoming even more prevalent within our environment. The point I'm trying to make here is the idea of stage skipping is what makes leapfrogging a, a reality. So when you think about leapfrogging, think about stage skipping. And these are examples of stage skipping. Now, the reason, and these are the examples. So remember what I said, stage skipping and path creation are the things that make um, leapfrogging. This is another example of path creation. This is a strategy that was used in the military um, in Japan during 1940s, during the World War II, I believe. Um, one of the strategies that, the one of the prevalent military strategies that was used by the US against the Japan, Japanese is called leapfrogging strategy. Um, it also has another name that I've forgotten, island hopping, I believe it is. And the strategy entailed almost them figuring out which are the big cities which Japan has uh, significant military strat uh, military people. And then they would ignore those big cities and they would go to the small cities around them. And so they would occupy the small cities. And as they occupy the small cities, then they would attack from the small cities. And so that was a form of leapfrogging. It was a military strategy that entailed by passing, isolating, heavily forfeited, fortified Japanese positions while preparing to take over strategically important islands. It entailed taking over an island, establishing a military base there. The base was in turn used as a launching point for the attack and takeover. And this made this process extremely fast and efficient. And it's what enabled them to win that battle. Each of those things these examples, their goal is to help us to think about leapfrogging in the context of our lives. 
Leapfrogging ultimately is about asking what I think stages I need to pass, what are the paths that I can create? And the summary of that may be innovation, but I find the name innovation is intimidating for me. Uh, the point here is, kama watu wanaendanga kisumu through this road. Starting to ask, what are other ways that you can go to Kisumu? In this military strategy, the ideal way would have been, let's go and attack. But for them, they started to say, let's leapfrog the main islands and let's go to the islands around that, that city. And so that leapfrogging in the, um, in the military, um, there's what's called a leapfrogging attack strategy in business. Um, and this is the indirect approach of challenging a competitor. So as opposed to going direct, after a competitor, instead you go to the places they are not in. So let's say I'm running schools and a majority of schools are in Nairobi. A leapfrogging attack strategy is to say, how do I go under, in, in underserved communities and set up schools that do so well that Nairobi asks for those schools? So a good example that has been used in this context and good example in the context of an example, not necessarily in this context of service, is Bridge International. And they came in and started in Liberia and started education, experimenting education systems there. And so by the time they were coming to places like Kenya, they're able to say, we've done this in Liberia, it worked. And so the leapfrogging attack strategy is about, as opposed to attacking your competitor in their place of ownership, you attack through the places they haven't gone to um, and you work through that. So this is an indirect approach to challenging a competitor by broadening your reach into their weaker or untapped markets. Um, you go into geographical areas they haven't gone to. Um, it's often associated with a diversification strategy or innovation as it often requires a business to diversify, innovate successfully to be able to implement. So, and this is why I talk about geographical leapfrogging often. For me, I think about the idea, for example, this idea of let's work with black people from across the world. I think of it as a leapfrogging strategy because it's easy to focus on one city as an example and say, we'll just work with black people in Africa. But if we figure out how black people in Haiti are brought in conversation, the US, the Brazil, what you're doing is you're creating a leapfrogging strategy that enables you and empowers you to ultimately be able to change the main basis. Um, Apple iPod leapfrogged the Sony Walkman, uh, the Love Film, Netflix's leapfrogged the blockbusters. So those are just additional examples. The last example um, that I like is actually the example of Nehemiah. Um, the Bible talks about how Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. And uh, we actually, I'm personally doing a study of the book of Nehemiah and alongside uh, one of some of the Lapid community. And, and, and let me also just say, I know there are very many people here who haven't done the Lapid program. I do hope that you were given sufficient information to make a decision to join. A lot of the things that we will cover here are things that we go into detail within the program. It allows you to be in the presence of people. Community is part of leapfrogging. You, if you go through, for example, the strategy that Nehemiah used, it's he worked through people. And so the people that you surround yourself enable you to be able to leapfrog. And so part of the reason I encourage us to join the program is to be part of that community. We say that the Lapid exists to equip people with the skills, the mindset, and the networks. I hear stories of people who've done the program and people in their own cohort enable them to get jobs. Um, I hear of people getting that. Yesterday I was being told of one of um, the people within Lapid being given a social media. It's a community and communities enable people to leapfrog. And then so you leapfrog your understanding of yourself, you leapfrog your understanding of business opportunities and ultimately that enables you to be able to innovate. And so that's some of the reasons why I advocate for people to join the program and I hope the links are there. So the last example is Nehemiah. Uh, leapfrogging often involves making significant advancements in a short amount of time. Nehemiah's ability to reconstruct the walls in just 52 days shows extraordinary levels of efficiency and speed. For me personally, for example, when I think about leapfrogging, the easiest summary of leapfrogging is ease and acceleration, doing things with speed and efficiency. Um, this rapid progress can be compared to leapfrogging where advancements are made quickly to overtake traditional slower paced approaches. 
So these examples hopefully help us to sit with what leapfrogging is, that it is path creating and it's stage jumping. And I invite you to sit up with that, to ask, especially if you're in business, how can I create new paths? How can I jump stages? And this is about, for example, um, thinking very differently um, and quite a bit of other things that I want to talk about in a short while. Okay, so, um, and this is just bringing home some of the advantages of leapfrogging. Um, it accelerates economic growth and productivity by adopting more advanced and innovative technologies that can enhance competitiveness and efficiency. Let me give you one, one last example. There's, um, there's an organization in Kenya today that's using ChatGPT to be able to increase access to health services. Um, there's an organization in the U.S. that's using chat GPT to be able to give access more personalized education. All those things are about leapfrogging. There's uh, some data, for example, that shows it would take at least 20 years for a young person or a kid in Kenya to be in the same level with a kid in the developed world as far as education goes. Over 20 years. I'm sure I've understated that. See one of the actual numbers. Uh, but I remember seeing it and seeing just some ridiculous numbers. But what technology leapfrogging does is it allows people to have access to things that they ordinarily wouldn't have access to in a faster way. And that then accelerates economic growth, accelerates access to, to services that all of us should have access to. But also that accelerates our ability to question what is not working. A lot of the economic systems, for example, I was in a conversation the other day and somebody was, the young people in Africa used to be an asset. Um, if you grew up when I did, and even more before that, there was a whole conversation of the demographic dividend that was called the youth. Right now, it is being called a headache. Like you see newspapers talking about the headache that's Africa's youth and how they are economically not delivering on the things that they should be delivering on. But that's re that's because the economic system is not built for African youth. It does not matter how many things we do. The reality is the economic systems need to be leapfrogged. And so that's what the whole idea of leapfrogging does. It enables us to ask, but what if the problem is not the youth? What is the problem is the economic systems that we've adopted? Do they even have the capacity to adopt, to absorb the numbers of people? And we will not stop giving birth because that's a normal part of life. So perhaps then the problem is the economic systems that we've adopted. So accelerating economic growth and productivity is one of the advantages of um LeapFrog introduces environmental impact uh, by avoiding and minimizing the use of fossil fuels. I've given you examples. Um, when you think about us leapfrogging towards the renewable energy, this is something I personally believe and I'm passionate about. I believe that one, we need to change conversations for climate change in Africa's context. It looks like this Mzungu problem. And people are catching on it because they think it has money and so we are following it. The, the truth, the reality is climate justice is a big problem in this continent. Let me give you an example. I won't go into too much details with this. I've written articles on it. You can read on them. But when you think about, for example, the debt crisis, which sounds irrelevant to us, but our dollar right now, so you may have to pay it to one sixty. And it might go to two hundred. Now, let me tell you what that means in your life. It means that we have very high levels of debt. So, if the debt levels at, as at last year was one shilling, I mean, it was one dollar, at the end of last year, that would have been one hundred bob. Right now, it would be one hundred and sixty bob. Now do that and multiply that by millions. And you understand then all your money today is going towards repaying debts. Now, that may sound like a nothing until you realize the state of our education, the state of our health system, the state of our infrastructure, and all we are doing is paying debts. So what climate justice invites us to do is ask, what is the impact of climate change, but from a holistic perspective? 
so that then it stops being about the hype of what technologies do we need and it becomes more about what philosophical changes do we actually first need to be able to leapfrog towards systems that work for us. And so, yes, reducing fossil fuels, but perhaps bigger is asking what conversations do we need to have that are different, that improve the uh, social inclusion, expand access to health, to education. How do we do that? How do we have access to health, to education when a bulk of our money is used to repay loans? When the, inf the inflation rate is ridiculous and when some countries during the pandemic were creating money, they were actually printing money and we pay the price for that today. So there's a lot of lip, uh, leapfrogging is advantage, yes, for us as humans. Uh, because leapfrogging was a military strategy. I think I've talked about this. Um, I don't know. And there's something here that is missing. But ultimately, Africa leapfrogging is not about so much technology. Technology is necessary, but it's fast the mindset. It's Africa has a unique opportunity to avoid repeating other countries' mistakes. Um, the leapfrogging mindset requires policies that foster innovation, not imitation. And so what I am perhaps saying here, especially to our youth and the people that we work with, challenge yourself not to be a person whose idea is that the West has their lives figured out, we meet it. If you're going to adopt my leapfrogging, that's all I ask for. I will not imitate. it. I will question and create. Please put that in my chat room. I will not imitate. I will question and create. If you do that alone, you've understood leapfrogging. I will not imitate. I will question and create. If your job is imitating, you're not leapfrogging in any way. You're actually escalating the problems. And that is and we'll have quite a number of webinars where we'll expand on this quite a bit. But it's in our social lives, it's in our personal lives, it's in our global perspectives. How do we get away from the idea of the solution is imitation? The solution is that the West are the ones who are the most successful. How do we create what works for us as, um, as people from the continent? So I want to share some I like to think in simplicity. And I think I came up with seven, seven S's um, that could help us to build a leapfrogging mindset. And actually, I will close with this. But perhaps maybe before you do that, let me actually hear from one or two people. What are you guys hearing? What are you hearing? What are some thoughts that are coming through for you? What are some questions? And I do, we may not even have the answers, but questions are a good part of the life in Lapid. Uh, we're constantly asking ourselves, what are we hearing? Because what you hear is very different from other people. And we want you to reflect back to us what you're hearing. So I'd love to hear from two, three people. Um, and I want to move fast. So if you know I know you, you better volunteer yourself. Well, what I'm hearing is that there are better ways to do things aside from the norm. Doesn't you don't have to if you don't have to use a bus to go to Mombasa, there's a chance to take the plane. I love that. And so leapfrogging is asking what are other ways that we could do things um, and, and using our imagination, our mindset to be able to perhaps think about those three things. And that's why it's called a revolution. Um, it, because it takes a lot of boldness to be able to sit with that truth. Um, anyone else? What are you hearing? What are some thoughts that are coming through for you? Um, for me, I'm hearing that uh, we all have a chance to live from, and it all starts with our mindset. We have to tap into our creative and innovative side. Yeah, I didn't hear you too well. Um, I think your vo your audio has a bit of an echo. Hello. Uh, hi. For me, what I'm hearing is that we are in a world where many things have happened, and that is change of the old to the new. So leapfrogging is reminding us to be in the current. That is um, embracing the technology and being with it. 
I like that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there's actually an actual class in lab. We do spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, and, and just embracing the fact that there's, we live in times that have changed. And um, there's a Bible verse that I love. You cannot put all new wine on old wineskin. And, and leapfrogging invites us to get rid of the old wineskins and start to question and build new wineskins. So I've done several things before, before I move forward. I started with explaining um, definitions for leapfrogging. My big outcome for this was to make sure that we all understand what leapfrogging is. I say that leapfrogging has two kind of elements, a stage jumping, kuruka stages and path creating. So sort of creating new paths. Um, I then used examples to help us see leapfrogging at work. We talked about leapfrogging that has happened in the mobile banking space. We've talked about the leapfrogging that's happening in the renewable energy space. We talked about the leapfrogging that's happening actually in the transport space and, and use all that to bring together that what has been done in the past is not necessarily what we need to be building in this age. Um, there's a class we spent quite a bit of time looking through the eras, the, from the industrial era, the knowledge era, the post-knowledge era, and seeing that this era is a very different era, but we will not get the most out of this. And there's a, there's a quote that we have within the community I'm talking about, it's called Taproot, and I love what they say. They say, climate change is not a moment. Think of climate change as a movement. And if we think about it as a movement, then it gives us an opportunity to ask what hasn't worked. And therefore then what can we create that has a different path from what was created in the past? And so that's the whole idea of leapfrogging. So this, this first session, as I mentioned, we'll have several others. I just wanted to introduce that, but also more importantly, spend some time on the mindset and just share some thoughts. And I've called them the seven S's of building a leapfrogging mindset. Um, I, and I've used the examples I've shared to come together with these seven S's. I've used the military leapfrogging, which I really like. I've used the Nehemiah leapfrogging, which I love. Um, I've used uh, the leapfrogging in my own personal life. I've used the leapfrogging in the studies that have been done for the m the, um, the mobile banking, because actually there's quite a bit of studies that have been done around what it looks like to leapfrog. Um, let me also just say, the first time I had this word was very, a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago with a guy called Professor uh, the late Professor J. Fred, James of Fred Kalista, he was a professor in, um, in Harvard and he was a Kenyan and he was very passionate about Africa rising. But one of the things that he said that I stayed with, and I know many people are very over the idea of leapfrogging today, especially from the context of the business world. There's no one else who is coming to save us, but us, so we have to hold on to our own things. Uh, but he said something that I believe, you cannot leapfrog out of bad thinking, you can't leapfrog out of bad governance, you can't leapfrog out of bad infrastructure. Um, and you can't, what that means is you can't skip the stage of building your mindset, like that's, like you can't leapfrog out of bad mindset, you can't leapfrog out of bad infrastructure, you can't leapfrog out of bad governance. Kuna vitu ambazo you have to deal with at their core. And so one of the ones that I will spend time today is around the mindset. So what kind of mindset do we need to have in today's world to be people who can leapfrog? And I came up with them as the seven S's and it's serves sight, self-awareness, strategic thinking skills, speed, and safety. Um, and I'll just quickly run through each one of these and sort of just share some thoughts against each one of them. Um, the first thing I have found that builds a leapfrogging mindset is actually service. Service is the idea of finding people who you want to sit under and serving them. And as you serve them, you build strength. So for this one, I'm going to use myself and the uh, story uh, and the record of um, Nehemiah. When I think about myself and the places that I have grown the most, I have had a phenomenal a back foundation in terms of my career, but actually the places that grew in me the most was when I was serving. And I served extensively in church. And that means I used to run discipleship classes on Sunday from morning to evening. I used to run a discipleship a class in, um, in prison and loved doing it. And you would always find me seated in a prison at 9 a.m. teach and would leave at around ideally at one or two. But it was so fantastic. We would go sometimes until God knows what time. 
And what those things did is they helped me to learn how to explain myself. I'm an accountant by training. We live in numbers. And so the reason I challenge people to serve is if you find a place where you can throw yourself into and your talents into and for the service of mankind and service of other people, what I have found is you gain skills that you often will not gain in mainstream places, but also from a biblical perspective, it's the way the Lord has always used to accelerate people. Let me give you two examples from a Bible. Um, people talk about David. And how he's a great king. But David became a great king when he'd gone to serve his brothers. I'll come and his brother's food. But even for Nehemiah, who did this in 52 days, the Bible records that he was a cup bearer. Now, a cup bearer is a man who serves. He takes what, when water is delivered to the king, they taste it and check whether that, whether at a wawa. That's the long and the short of it. That's why they're called cup bearers. So the cup comes, they test the water. If they die, they die. <laughs> but if they don't die, then the king can have the water. So he was serving the king. And what that did is it exposed him to the king. And when it exposed him to the king, when he needed help, then the king was able to offer him that help. The point I'm trying to make here is when you serve, there's a strength that you gain that develops that and a, a grit that you need to have leapfrogging mindset. You see, the things that we are talking about are not things that we will close our eyes and voila, we have been able to move away from uh, using uh, the economic systems that we are using. We have wished away the social systems that we have today and wished away poverty and wished away the levels of debt that Kenya has. These things will, will happen today or tomorrow. They will need consistency. And so leapfrogging mindset needs a high level of greed. And that level of greed is built as you serve. There's a strength that comes with it. And so what I would encourage us to think about are the places where this year, you, there's a mission that you believe in and that you're going to throw yourself after. And you're going to serve in those organizations. And so my experience has been service is a way of building your leapfrogging mindset. The second thing that's important in building your leapfrogging mindset is sight. I'll also still use, um, I'll use the military and, and Nehemiah. And, and it's that for you to build leapfrogging, you must think outside the box. Now imagine the U.S. thinking about this is how we're going to attack Japan. We're going to go to islands around it, the small islands. That's about sight. What do you see? And that's what vision is about. And so expanding your sight is an important part of building your leap for game mindset. How do you build your sight? How do you build your capacity to be able to see other pathways to go to Mombasa apart from the bus? It's through exposure. And that's why building, joining communities like this helps because you're exposing your mind to new thoughts and new ways of thinking. And that's what dancing is called dancing with diversity. What dancing with diversity does is it expands your way of thinking. There's a, there's a report that was released the other day around TikTok. And they said that the global leaders of adoption of TikTok are Kenyans. Kuna kakitu tunakuanga nako of adopting things. We adopted mobile banking like madness very fast. We've adopted renewable energy very fast. TikTok baka tumefanyo global leaders. And that's, that's me saying our innate sight is actually not limited. It's actually high. But the ways to keep growing your sight is to find a way to dance with diversity. Go to communities that you haven't interacted with. Now, I tell people in the lapid classes when I was in campus, I don't know if this happened still. Kulkwana, this thing of if you're from Moranga, you would only sit with girls from Moranga. If you're from um, Kitui, you'd sit in the Kitui community. Now, what that does is it reduces your diversity and that then shrinks your sight. So if you want to increase sight, you must embrace being in spaces that have people who think differently from how you think. What that does is it gives you fresh perspectives that enable you to build differently. And so for me, for example, one of the things that I'm grateful for for the last three years, God has built, taken me to such diverse global communities from the Obama Foundation, and I was the only African woman in our cohort, to the, um, the Oprah Foundation, which is awarded to only one African woman every year, and literally ended up doing quite a bit of work with a New York University, and I was the only 
African woman. Now, what that gave me is a site that allows me to create things very differently. Now, not all of us will go and not all of us should go. But all of us should get diverse experiences because that's what increases your sight. And the thing that I like about Lapid is that's a very central part of us. So part of the reason why you hear us talking about Africa experience, for example, the students go to countries within the region, we're expanding their sight. What part of the reason you hear that we have a diverse network of mentors? I don't run. I probably run very few classes. But that's to increase the diversity and to increase the sight of the people. So sight and vision are a big part of leapfrogging mindset. The third thing that's equally important is self-awareness. I always tell people you will build what you are. So when you think again about this in the context of Nehemiah, Nehemiah knew what he didn't have. He didn't have timber and I don't know what else. And so when the king comes to him to ask, what do you need? He's able to say specific things. Now that's only built if you have strong sense of self-awareness. Um, there's a there's a clip I've put up in my Patreon and if uh, I'll ask one of the people to get that Patreon account and sort of just share the link here. But the uh, uh, one of the things I talked about, charity, you can get access to it and you can share it here. Um, but one of the things I talk about in that account is there's a video that I saw of this buffalo that was being chased by a lion. It can be sure, it can be sure it has run, it has run. And then somewhere along the way, it stops and it looks at the lion and it almost realizes, why am I running? And you can see the lion backtracking. And that's what the power of self-awareness is. Self-awareness allows you to do things faster because then you know what you have and you also know what you don't have. Let me give you one last example. I, in December, I went to visit a good friend of mine in, um, in Meru. And one of the conversations we were having was with a friend of mine that I've known for very many years. And he was telling the person that I was with that I my first car was a Subaru. And he was telling him that I was driving it in 2006, thereabouts. And he was telling him how I used to drive it very fast. And I think a part of me had forgotten that. I generally drive at the range of 60 to 80. I'm that cautious driver. But there's something that happened as we had that conversation. It's something that was unlocked. And I found that when we were coming back, we had such ease and speed. Like it was almost like that conversation took away the fear. I remembered how I used to drive. Now, the point I'm trying to make here, self-awareness allows you to understand your strengths, understand your capacity, understand the places that you would thrive. And when you do that, you're able to create solutions. You're able to find help. Unfortunately, many people don't know what help they need. Let me give you one last example. Recently, um, one of the things that we do in Lapid is we do personality tests and introduce them to what those personalities mean for them. And um, for example, a personality that's called an architect, um, in one of the personality types. We use Myers-Briggs, but you can also use a culture index. And I'm an architect in the culture index. And an architect means I can build. And the 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 that framework gives you the things you're strong at. So for example, my autonomy is very high. My dynamity or dynamism, if there's such a thing, I'm very dynamic in short and I'm very analytical. But also it has, I have zero S. S is social. Um, and I remember the first time I looked at it and I thought, really, Mimi, I didn't think I have zero S. Uh, but turns out I'm extremely driven by authenticity. And so I'm a horrible persuader of things I don't believe in. And so that's what they were measuring. Um, and, and what that tells me, and we had a conversation with a coach, my coach, my own conversation around it, which was, I need persuaders around me. Because I'm extremely logical in how I think about things. That's what self-awareness is. If you're going to build things, which is what leapfrogging enables us to do, you must have awareness of what you're good at. I remember having a coaching session, and I'm going to put one of us, I want to give the name, but having conversations, coaching sessions with some of the cohorts and hearing just how much creativity they have. And then also hearing how much leadership skills they have and understanding the magic of those two. So understanding what are the strengths that you have enables you to know what can you create. I remember listening to one of them and hearing how they are creative, but they're doing a course in physics. And it's very easy for physics to rob your creativity because it sounds very logical. 
Uh, and so self-awareness is a very big part of leapfrogging mindsets. How do you build self-awareness? Be part of communities where you're going to get coaching. For some of us, we need therapy um, because then that also starts to address some of the gaps that we have. But self-awareness is a very big part of the leapfrogging mindset. The fourth thing that you need as part of the leapfrogging is a strategic thinking, um, which enables you to plan and execute. And I can't build this enough here. Um, but when you think about this, the military strategy that the U.S. built, the leapfrogging strategy, or when you think about what it took for us to leapfrog from um, zero banking or low banking to mobile banking, actually, there was quite a bit of strategic thinking behind it. I was reading about how um, the governor, the CBK governor, so the innovation and they decided let's watch this and the reason they decided let's watch this as opposed to let's stop it is they saw there's some thinking behind what was being done and so you cannot leapfrog if you haven't developed a heightened capacity towards strategic thinking that enables you to think about to bridge ideas and execution now i tell people people tend to operate in one extreme you're a creative and as a creative, you think about ideas with ease. But ideas will never move anything. It's the execution that enables people to move. On the other hand, there are people who are just executive, very strong at execution. They don't have ideas. Now, you need to have that awareness. We were discussing this with a, a, a good friend of mine yesterday, and she... um She's running some leadership programs um in South Africa. And... She was talking about just the awareness of what she's good at within that spectrum and how that has enabled her to build the institutions that she has built. And so understanding that for you to build, you need ideas, you need bridge that executes, then you have the nice end product. And then therefore then asking, am I am an idea person? Do I need to build execution? And this is part of the reason why service is an important thing and serving with humility as well. Because my experience has been people will grow you as far as your humility goes. When you do not have humility, people start to hold back, hold back, hold back, hold back. But if you work with people with heightened doses of, of humility, then they are able to see what you have and expose you to what you don't have. And you start to build the skills in between. You will never have everything, but at least to have a dose that you're able to work with in terms of the leapfrogging mindset. This is a whole chapter of a conversation. And I don't think I'm able to go in more details beyond that today. Um, and then ultimately think about what skills do you need? And leapfrogging is about having entrepreneurial skills. Now, many of us think about entrepreneurship in the context of building businesses. And this is prevalent in Kenya, where we've made the idea of being your own boss, everything. But actually, you can actually do entrepreneurial work and good entrepreneurial work within employment spaces. And we spend quite a bit of time on that within our cross post program and ask, what does entrepreneurship look like? Because even the organizations that we work for and work with need leapfrogging. So, for example, um, in the last cohort of Lead Marketplace, they were doing some work around digitization for a microfinance institution. That is about leapfrogging it from analog to digital. And many people think it's just a hard skills process, but it's also a soft skills process. And so building the entrepreneurial skills that you need to be able to put together both entrepreneurial ventures and intrapreneurial ventures. The one thing, other thing I wanted to highlight here is again, please go. Um, I can't go into all the details here because of time, and we will figure out how we do some of these things later. But the if you look at Nehemiah and how he rebuilds in 52 days, he has a strategy. And part of that strategy is he assigns people corners. So they don't work together. It's where we're in the corner. So on the right, you put up your wall, you focus on your wall on this corner, you focus on your wall on this corner, you focus on your wall on this corner. That's a strategy. And then he goes about building the team skills. Um, there's a part where they talk about how when he landed, he went around assessing what was available within the place. So team building, team management is part of your entrepreneurial skills. And then discernment, actually, he talks about how this, one of my favorite parts of um, this story is how he says he held the sword with one hand and they built with the other hand. 
And that's the whole idea around how do you make sure that you're using the sword, for example, um, to pray, to fight what you need to fight, and yet not be derailed to spend your whole life fighting, that you're also still building. And so all those things are skills that entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs must have because they then enable you to be able to finish the work. And that's me saying it's not just inspiration that gets people to leapfrog. They're actually actual skills, leadership skills, entrepreneurship skills that you need to be able to uh, put up the building. And then there's the speed and derailers because I was forcing on the S's. Um, so serve, have sight, build self-awareness, have a strategic mind, um, build the skills that you need to be a leapfrogger. And then there's speed and derailers. And again, I'll use the story of Nehemiah, which I again clearly love a lot. Um, but there's a place where Nehemiah talks about um, there were Tobias and Sambalats who had been sent his way and their job was to derail him. Now, let me just speak to anyone here who is called to leapfrog. This is your truth. The job of leapfrogging is not a linear process. The job of leapfrogging from um, lack of finances to mobile banking, the job of leapfrogging from a strategy where you're going to do island hoping is not a straight line. I was in a conversation recently and I was talking about how one of the gaps of our education system is it doesn't allow teachers to sit with ambiguity. I promise you the ambiguity between Oh my God, Mpesa idea to Mpesa today is significant. And, and so what you must build the skill for is speed and yet getting away from derailers. I love the way Nehemiah goes about this. Tobias goes away, he's refused. He tells him, I cannot calm down, I'm doing important work. Figuring out what are the battles you want to fight. And then in addition to that, he Tobias sends another crew of people to come and derail him. But he has discernment of these people are here to derail my life. And he says, I will not get distracted by these people. And the point here being, and this is harder for young people, but just write it because I say it. It's understanding the power of focus. And today's age, because of social media, we have short fuses. Remember what I said up here, ability to embrace boredom. Building is a boring process. Leapfrogging is a boring process. Very boring, actually. And you must build your capacity to focus, to say, this is the assignment. This is what I'm doing. I was telling somebody, I, I left formal employment in 2004. In the last 10 years, a whole 10 years, the thing I have focused on heavily is what Lapid is called to do. Now, the kind of jumping that we've normalized. And so I was trying to explain this. What happens with social media is we have short fuses. Our attention span is short. We are all looking for dopamine to mesoeshua. Because of that, small things derail us. Your friends start talking, you're derailed. Our capacity to sit with things without derailment has been reduced. But if you're going to leapfrog, you cannot be doing M-Pesa without having the capacity for derailment. And so that focus is a very big part of it. And then lastly is around safety. This one I added because I was looking for eight. I think is an important part of it. It's around safety. And we talk about this in Lapid a lot, but it's around internal and external safety. There's, um, there's a book that we read within the Crossroads program that talks about the three needs that humans have. We have a need for safety. We have a need for approval that becomes a need for control. So if you think about how we evolved, we this is, think about the movie, growing, evolving with lions all around us. And you then build a heightened need for safety. And so all of us have a high need for safety. I am looking for feeling safe. Now, if I'm not feeling safe, that becomes approval seeking because we evolved with the idea that when you're not safe, if people like you, you will be fine. And so that becomes our approval need. Then if you're not safe and you're not getting approval, it becomes control. 
And so well, the reason many people actually control things is the lack of safety. And so the for you to leapfrog, frog, because imagine you're working in a place with chaos and you need to find ways to curate the chaos and order the chaos. So building structures within those chaos, but also making room for chaos. It's a bit of both. For you to do that, you must have internal safety and an external safety. And so that's what curating the chaos enables people to do, to be able to feel I am safe. And that's past an internal job that says whether M-Pesa works or not, I will be alive. I am known by the Lord. And so you have internal safety. And external safety of asking, what are the systems and the structures that I can put up that mean even as we leapfrog, we have safety. So that's about community, for example. So that even as you're experimenting, there are people you share with your experiment. And all those things talk about safety. Okay. So those are the eight ideas I want us to sit with. To ask, am I serving? Have I developed my sight? If not, how do I expose myself to diverse perspectives? Do I have a heightened sense of self-awareness? If not, sign up for lead self in Lapid. Do I have strategic thinking? Again, find places to serve because that builds your capacity to think strategically and also build your humility capacities because that's what will enable people to expose you to things that enable you to learn how to build systematically. And then skills, what skills do I need? And these skills perhaps is a whole session that we will focus on later on. And then speed and derail us. What is my capacity in terms of focus? Do I start things, I leave them in the middle? What support do I need to be able to deal with the derailers? What kind of discernment do I need to pray for? So that when I see a derailer, like, get behind me, Satan. And then safety. What will give you safety? What communities do you need to, to be part of to be safe? What spiritual systems do you put, need to put around yourself to feel safe? What social systems do you need to have around you to feel safe? And so building the awareness that all of us have a high need for safety. And that enables you then to start to build your leapfrogging mindset. 